The cab ride I will never forget. There was a time in my life twenty years ago when I was driving a cab for a living. It was a cowboy's life, a gambler's life, a life for someone who wanted no boss, constant movement, and the thrill of a dice roll every time a new passenger got in the cab. What I didn't count on when I took on the job was that it was also a ministry. Because I drove the night shift, my cab became a rolling confessional. Passengers would climb in, sit behind me in total anonymity, and tell me of their lives. We were like strangers on a train, the passengers and I, hurtling through the night, revealing intimacies we would have never dreamed of sharing during the brighter light of day. I encountered people whose lives amazed me, ennobled me, and made me laugh and made me weep. And none of those lives touched me more than that of a woman I picked up late on a warm August night. I was responding to a call from a small brick fourplex in a quiet part of town. I assumed I was being sent to pick up some parsers, or someone who had just had a fight with a lover, or someone going off to an early shift at some factory for the industrial part of town. When I arrived at the address, the building was dark, except for a single light in the ground floor window. Under these circumstances, many drivers would just honk once or twice, wait for a short minute, and then drive away. Too many bad possibilities awaited a driver who went up to a darkened building at 2.30 in the morning. But I had seen too many people trapped in a life of poverty who depended on the cab as their only means of transportation. Unless the situation had a real whiff of danger, I always went to the door to find the passenger. It might, I reasoned, be someone who needs my assistance. Would I not want a driver to do the same if my mother or father had decided to call a cab? So I walked to the door and knocked. Just a minute, answered a frail and elderly voice. I could hear the sound of something being dragged across the floor. After a long pause, the door opened. A small woman somewhere in her eighties stood before me. She was wearing a print dress and a pillbox hat with a veil pinned on it, like you might see in a costume shop or a goodwill store or in a 1940s movie. By her side was a small nylon suitcase. The sound had been her dragging it across the floor. The apartment looked as if no one had lived in it for years. All the furniture was covered with sheets. There were no clocks on the walls, no knickknacks or utensils on the counters. In a corner was a cardboard box filled with photos and glassware. Would you carry my bag out to the car? she said. I'd like a few moments alone, and if you could come back and help me. I'm not very strong. I took the suitcase to the cab, then returned to assist the woman. She took my arm, and we walked slowly towards the curb. She kept thanking me for my kindness. Ah, oh, it's nothing, I told her. I just try to treat my passengers the way I would want my mother to be treated. Oh, you're such a good boy, she said. Her praise and appreciation were almost embarrassing. When we got in the cab, she gave me an address and then asked, Could you drive me through downtown? It's not the shortest way, I answered. Oh, I don't mind, she said. I'm in no hurry. I'm on my way to a hospice. I looked in the rearview mirror. Her eyes were glistening. I don't have any family left, she continued. The doctor said I should go there. He says I don't have very long. I quietly reached and shut off the meter. What route would you like me to go? I asked. For the next two hours, we drove through the city. She showed me the building where she had once worked as an elevator operator. We drove through the neighborhood where she and her husband had lived when they first had been married. She had me pull up in front of a furniture warehouse that had once been a ballroom where she had gone dancing as a girl. Sometimes she would have me slow down in front of a particular building or a corner and she would sit staring through the darkness, saying nothing. As the first hint of sun was creasing the horizon, she suddenly said, I'm tired. Let's go now. We drove in silence to the address she had given me. It was a low building, like a small convalescent home with a driveway that passed under the portico. Two older lies came out to the cab as soon as we pulled up. Without waiting for me, they opened the door and began assisting the woman. They were solicitous and intent, watching her every move. They must have been expecting her. Perhaps she had phoned them right before we left. I opened the trunk and took the small suitcase up to the door. The woman was already seated in a wheelchair. How much do I owe you? she asked, reaching into her purse. Nothing, I said. You have to make a living, she answered. 
There are other passengers, I responded, almost without thinking. I bent and gave her a hug. She held on to me tightly. You gave an old woman a little moment of joy, she said. Thank you. There was nothing more to say. I squeezed her hand once and then walked out into the dim morning light. Behind me, I could hear the door shut. It was the sound of a closing of a life. I did not pick up any more passengers at shift. I drove aimlessly, lost in thought. For the remainder of the day, I could hardly talk. What if that woman had gotten an angry driver, or one who was impatient to end his shift? What if I had refused to take her run, or had honked once, then driven away? What if I had been in a foul mood, and had refused to engage the woman in conversation? How many other moments like that had I missed or failed to grasp? We are so conditioned to think that our lives revolve around great moments. But great moments often catch us unawares. When that woman hugged me and said I had brought her a moment of joy, it was possible to believe that I had been placed on this earth for the sole purpose of providing her with that last ride. I do not think that I have ever done anything in my life that was any more important.